And welcome back one last time to our London studio uh, for the final solution session of Leaders Week Direct. Before we get into it, exciting news about uh, a virtual beer. You'll be excited about this news, uh, James. A virtual beer, uh, a virtual um, networking session uh, happening at the top of the hour. And you can find out all the details about how to join that right now on the activity stream here on the platform. Uh, today's solution session is brought to you and us by Comcast Technology Solutions, and we're going to have a discussion uh, about uh, media strategies in this new age. And James, over my shoulder, yes. there you are, still there. Hi. Uh, you've got a couple of guests to introduce. I do, but I'd just like to pick you up on beer, David. It could be a cocktail. It could be a mocktail, it could be a coffee, given how international this event is. Do you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm absolutely right. right. I'm here, I'm joined on the wall uh, by Mr. Ben Davison and Mr. Ali Russell. How are you, gents? Do you read really? me? Good. Um, first question to both of you. It's, uh, it's a simple one, I hope. Please, could you just uh, introduce yourself and um, tell us a bit about your role and responsibilities? Ben, if you'd like to go first. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Ben Davison. I'm the uh, European Sales Director of Comcast Technology Solutions. Some of you may ask, who is Comcast Technology Solutions? Uh, well, we are the, as it says in the name, we're the technology arm of Comcast. And what we do is we take Comcast uh, um, scalable, reliable um, platform and make it available to um, some of the biggest media companies and sports broadcasters in the world. And Ali, over to you. Yeah, good afternoon, James. Um, I was drinking a cup of tea, so um, not quite uh, beer o'clock, but um, I'm the CMO of Extreme E and I'm currently in a transition from formerly a business that uh, I helped start um, eight years ago to starting a new proposition, which is um, uh, called Extreme E. And I, I think what's so exciting about it is it's, it's morphing electrification, sustainability, and equality into a sport for purpose. So we kick off next year. Um, the product doesn't have, uh, the sport doesn't have any fans on location because of the uh, extreme locations we go to. So we didn't develop it for COVID, but actually, funnily enough, it is, it is absolutely perfect for the, the, the current state of affairs that we, we've inherited. So um, we are getting ready. Um, we're building our ships going through refurb. Our teams are coming on board. Our drivers are coming on board. And it's an incredibly exciting time for our business. Good stuff. Uh, welcome both. Um, if you have any questions for Ben or Ali over the next uh, few minutes, uh, do post them uh, on the uh, platform and they will come right through to us and we will pass them on uh, to the gents. Um, ben, let's, let's start with you. Uh, this is a big, broad question and it's a big, broad topic. But in what ways are you seeing technology being used to power new revenue streams at the moment? It's, as you say, a very big and broad uh, question, and actually a question that's, uh, that's, that's really changed quite a bit in, uh, in the last two months. Um, obviously, with the, uh, the current situation with live sport, um, where we have very limited live sport, people are really looking to, to other ways that they can monetize their back catalog of content. And not just monetize the back catalog, actually be able to get some sort of engagement towards their fans um, that isn't really kind of just uh, putting content on YouTube. Um, you know, I think, I, think, I think one of the things that we're uh, talking to quite a lot of people about at the moment is, is what's been termed as the lean back experience. It's giving people the option of being able to uh, watch a like live experience on um, previously live content. Um, you know, I think people really struggle sometimes with trolling through VOD uh, or video on demand decks looking for certain bits of content. And what they really want is they want to be able to lean back and just watch that content as it was live. Um, you know, there's it's been some great um, stuff that's been talked about this week in Leaders already. Um, I think it was uh, uh, really good on Monday when Libby was talking about The Last Dance. And actually, it's, it's quite topical at the moment because um, obviously The Last Dance has been such a great success on Netflix and everybody's watching it. We have people like the Olympic Channel are now looking through their archives and being able to actually pull out the, um, the dream team content of, of 
the uh, the uh, the basket, the American basketball team moving all the way to the gold medal in the uh, the Olympics. And uh, and so what they're doing is they're they're, they're using that as a lean back experience to capitalise on on the uh, on the last dance excitement that there is. Same question to you, um, Ali. Obviously, uh, Formula E and now into Extreme E, uh, a, a pioneer in many ways. Um, how have you seen this uh, increase in technology and and how it's being used to to create revenue? Well, I think I think it's a, a, a really um, obviously we, we've we've got a horrendous situation with COVID at the moment. But I think what we're seeing is the sports industry at its best, which is um, the agility, the moving, the developing. And, and I think what's happening is we're, we're all looking to innovate and looking to, to develop our, our propositions. So you had Bundesliga that um, had matches behind closed doors on the weekend. You had NASCAR in the, in the United States, which had you know, record audiences on the weekend. Um, I think Ben's um, talked about The Last Dance, you know, probably the most successful sports documentary ever. So what we're seeing is we're seeing content is still king and that, you know, whether it's reformatting archives, whether it's live digital conversations between um, tennis players or athletes, um, there's a huge number of activities that I think every, every sports franchise is, is done in, in the community. Um, you know, we're, we're getting used to this new world. And I think what's so exciting at the moment is um, what technology we're going to look at in terms of it improving. And, and I think what we've got is five years worth of R&D, which I think is, is going to happen in the next three months in terms of matches without fans. You know, how do, how do you change the experience for the consumer? You know, is there... Is there cameras in the change room? Do you, do you mic up the refs? You know, do you virtually put the fans in the stadium? Do you create noise, uh, which, which is, you know, in a relationship between a, a fan app and, and noise in the stadium? All these sort of aspects um, were probably pipe dreams uh, in January. And now you've got, you know, execs across the world looking at what, what can be brought out, how VR, how AR um, can be brought in in a very meaningful way to improve the, the experience, which has been diminished by not having live fans there. And I guess what you're talking about there, Ali, is um, an acceleration of a, an innovation process to, to really get under the skin of what sport can be and, and represent it for viewers at home. And a lot of that um, sort of goes to uh, the process of digital transformation, which organizations have been going through across the board to different sort of speeds, I guess. And with that in mind, a question for both of you, um, but Ben, maybe we'll start with you. What does a great digital first approach look like and how does it differ from the old linear first approach? I think we've come a long way in ways that we produce content. And obviously not being a content producer ourselves, what we see is, is, is the content that comes from our customers and from the um, people that, um, that are delivering content to us. And one of those things is, is, you know, second screen interaction can be very different than a main screen. So think about how someone will um, interact with their television in their living room and how they'd interact with having a device on their knee. Now, if you're watching a sports game or on your large screen TV and it has a great crawler, like, like we have a great crawler above our heads here, actually, if you're watching that on a portable device, on a small device, you know, unless that, that, that graphic actually um, dynamically changes um, to be able to support that device, um, it, it will be unreadable and unusable. So. It's those kind of things from a digital first idea that we need to make sure that we are producing for everything. Um, I think definitely on, a, on advertising as well. We talk about how people work with a different, uh, with a smaller screen or a second screen. They may be dipping in and out of content. Now, traditionally on a normal piece of content, you may run some um, dynamic advertising, which is great. But what you want to make sure is that someone's dipping in and out you're not playing in six commercials while they're going to watch the, the first piece of content for the fourth time because they're going to stop coming to your portal and stop watching that content. So it's being able to 
to gauge what your users are doing. It's being able to make sure that the product that you're delivering is, is, is all about at every level. And Ali, I guess you've had to sort of take this digital first mindset with you when uh, coming up with the Extreme E concept. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I think what, what, what uh, businesses and rights holders used to do was to take traditional linear content and, and just recut it and repurpose it and, and, and put it out. And I think what's happened now is that, you know, if you look at the move from millennials who were, you know, maybe the, the, the cord cutters and, you know, Gen Z is, is, is fast coming up and, and, and the relevance of Gen Z is, is certainly here and now is they've, they've, they've never had a cord. You know, they, they've got tablets, they've got um, uh, smartphones and, you know, they're watching a variety of content when they want to watch it. So, you know, yes, there's live sport, but there's, there's, there's VOD on, on demand at any point. So I think, you know, sports rights holders have, and, and media companies need to get their heads around the new habits and serving um, the customer the, the right product at the right time in the format that they want. So the way that we look at um, content now is developing it first for digital and then stitching it together. So during COVID time, we've brought out uh, a documentary, but the documentary was based on a lot of short form products that we made for digital. And then when COVID lockdown happened, we knitted it together and created a, a, a um, longer form bit of material. So I think the mindset now is digital first, whereas traditionally it was linear. And I think the, the opportunities that it gives um, all rights holders now before you you, you, you had to find a, a channel. Well, I'm, I'm Scottish, so traditionally I would have sold Scottish rugby or Scottish football to STV or to BBC Scotland. Now you don't need necessarily to have those companies involved. There's a variety of other opportunities. Some are aggregation of, uh, 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 of, of content like uh, Netflix and Amazon or a sports specific zone, or you can create your own OTT proposition. So it, there's a lot more flexibility in the marketplace to, to grow and develop your own product and, and to create an always on uh, relationship with your fans. So 24 seven, you're delivering uh, digital content. Ali, you, um, you obviously have a great live product um, with Formula E. I'm not sure how advanced your plans are in terms of live or non-live with Extreme E, but um, what's your approach in general terms around um, monetizing content outside of the live broadcast, the live product? Well, I, I, think, I think live is king. And, um, you know, we've all watched a, a lot of archive material in, in lockdown, but ultimately it comes back to live is, is what people want. But in terms of how they watch it, near live clips, um, you know, it, it's 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 that sort of integration and, and, and that building a product. We're, we're actually going with a live product from the Arctic, from the Amazon, um, you know, from from uh, the coast of, of, of Senegal. And we're beaming that back. And, and because we, we don't have consumers on site, it means that we can we can create the product so that it's absolutely perfect for a European time zone. So we super serve people a global product, but with the time zone being super served so that they, you know, we can put it at a time when people want to watch live, uh, live content. So, you know, I think that's been successful. I think data, and, and I think Ben mentioned it before, but the second screen experience and, and how we commercialize that second screen and, with motorsport, that can be driver's radio, that can be um, GPS positioning, that can be uh, onboard cameras. You know, it just, it's giving the, the um, I suppose, the director's cut to the consumer. So they can pick what they watch, when they want to watch it, who, who they want to listen to in terms of the, the commentators. So there's a lot more choice. And I think that's what's coming, coming through is user generated content is, is growing hugely at the moment. And uh, what that allows is, is fans to, to bespoke exactly what they want to do when they want to do it. And I, and I see that trend continuing. Um, we'll certainly come back to that sort of uh, personalization that you talk about um, in a second. Ben, just want to come to you on the, uh, the non-live 
uh, monetization. Uh, from your perspective, from Comcast Technology Solutions perspective, how do you see that um, playing out currently and, and playing out in the future? Yeah, again, it's a, I think it's a question which is a, very important right now, as, as we said earlier. I think, um, I mean, I'd go back to my position on the lean back experience, um, you know, by, by putting together these, you know, as live ideas, you're trying to emulate or give people the idea of a product that they're missing. I think also, you know, it's really looking at, at, at the, the rich back catalog that some of these organizations have. So taking that back catalog and, and, and actually using it in the same way as, to, as as pushing out what people are interested in, we talk about the last dance. We've had multiple different documentaries on, uh, on on Amazon around the NFL and around Manchester City. You know, it's really kind of looking at what you have and what you're able to use um, to kind of capitalise on those areas. I think also, it's not just about putting together what would look like a uh, a linear channel. It's also being able to give personalisation in that area as well. If you want that lean back experience, but you still know what you want to watch, it's being able to put that in there um, and making kind of, um, your own personalized channels. And let's not forget, we want to be able to monetize those channels as well. We actually want to be able to make money from this stuff. We want to continue on to be able to push content, great content to our fans. We want to keep them engaged. We want to make sure that our fans are getting their kind of super feeds that they like. But we also want to monetize it as well. So being able to kind of dynamically advertise on that content, I think is key as well. Ali, you um, mentioned that the Extreme E proposition uh, was put together without the idea of fans coming to watch the races. It's simply too extreme to have fans uh, there, even if they were allowed to be. Um, what do you expect in terms of technology to help when it comes to building new business propositions around um, no fans in venues uh, ideas? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think what we want to do is play to our strengths. So the, the locations we go to, it's, it's, um, we, we, we talk about it as uh, Dakar meets Blue Planet on speed. And, you know, the environments themselves are, are dramatic. You know, you, you, I was in Greenland in the summer and, and unfortunately it was on the hottest day in record. And just seeing these, the way that these environments are affected by climate change is, is soul destroying. So I think we have an opportunity to create a narrative around sport for purpose. And I think that's quite unique. And what we've got to be is true to that. So um, to show an authentic behind the scenes. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we look at new technology is how do we use that in such a way that it's really, really sensitive. So we're looking instead of having physical um, uh, branding at, at, at the, the, the race course that we've chosen, we're looking to have um, VR um, and AR in terms of so that we could augment brands in, in areas where they should be and not ruin the, the, the incredible vistas we've got here because we've got a very unique selling point and we want to be true to that. Um, and I think you know, when, when you look at, you know, technology and what's available to, to help you, you know, the, the overlay in terms of graphics, we're, we're targeting a much, much younger audience, an audience that maybe is, is, is more afraid to, to Fortnite than it is with UEFA. And so what we're trying to do is to, to, to gamify and to allow people not just to view, but to interact and to overlay that, that, that sort of heads up display so that it would be more akin to, to maybe, um, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a computer game than it would be in terms of a traditional um, sporting proposition. And we hope what that allows us to do is to, to have much more of an interactive relationship with the younger audience and, and ultimately the audience that's going to be purchasing, purchasing electric vehicles in the future. Mm. And Ben, uh, same question to you. What else are you seeing in terms of technology helping uh, build business propositions around um, sport with no fans? I think as a technologist, my biggest thing that I've got to say is you just got to get the basics right. It has to have a very good user experience. It has to have reliable delivery and low latency. You, know, you have to be able to get those basics right before you can um, look at um, you know, any kind of proposition. From there, you know, I think one of the biggest things we're, we're talking about right now, especially with the football we're seeing, is atmosphere and engagement. Uh, and how do we how do we make the atmosphere 
like it's not a Sunday league game, but a football game. How do we um, in- still engage the fans in- in- into that? Um, you know, what about new engagement methods on that? How do we embroil, how do we pull social into what we're doing um, right now, especially if it is uh, an OTT proposition, so we're looking at on our, on our device anyway. How do we pull kind of, you know, a social aspect into it or a second screen side of it? Um, you know, are we going to be really looking at VR and AR? I know Ali had some great um, stuff about um, VR and AR there, but, you know, we looked at some great stuff two or three years ago. Um, you know, there was a company called Live Light that were doing some really good stuff in the Premier League that I was involved with at the time. Um, you know, being able to have uh, what looks like a uh, an experience in stadium and have a virtual buddy sat next to you that you're able to talk to over some sort of VoIP. Um, really kind of look at that side of things. A, a, a true fan cam. If we if we have empty stadiums, we can put cameras anywhere. So there is so much more um, opportunity here. And also the delivery with the delivery methods that we have now on an OTT platform, we have so much more opportunity to deliver as many of these methods as we can, not still constrained by the big box in the front room, although we still want to be able to deliver a really good experience there as well. It, it brings us uh, maybe neatly on to the idea of gamification, uh, which um, I know, again, is something that in Formula E has been uh, front and centre ever since the series launch with the fan boost um, uh, vote during the race um, to, to give uh, drivers and, and cars uh, an extra power boost. Um, Ali, talk a little bit about how that, uh, that gamification um, approach has evolved over the few years uh, since Formula E launched and again what you're going to be doing in order to take uh, some of that um, into Extreme E. Yeah, I, I think I think it really came from trying to reframe a, a sport to a younger um, audience, and so we came up with the proposition of, of uh, fan boost. And you're absolutely right; it was voting for your favourite driver, and the, the, the drivers with the most votes get a fan boost, which they can use at any point during the race, which allows them to either overtake or protect against an overtake manoeuvre. So there's a sporting benefit. So the rationale was around um, drivers really competing for, for fans. So getting involved in, in social media in such a way that because they're competitive with each other, if, if, if they've got success with fans, they get more votes. And as a consequence, um, they're getting more power during the race. And that seemed to be the, 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 the right way to, to look at the sport. You, you couldn't have put that sort of mechanic on an existing sport or it would have been very, very difficult to do that. But I think when you're starting with a blank sheet of paper, you can come up with concepts and ideas and, and developments. And that gamification has been one of the successful parts. I mean, if you speak to anyone under the age of 24 and you talk about fan boost and you talk about this live involvement between you and what you're watching, and the fact that you can give someone more more power, people love it. It's it's absolutely brilliant. The drivers love it, the fans love it, and, and, it, and it's a far more immersive experience. And over the, the years, we've we've evolved, we've developed, and we've tried to gamify even more. And 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 I suppose one of one of the aspects has been something called attack zone, which is um, with our generation two cars, we we moved away the, from the need of, of two cars and a car swap in the middle. And what we wanted to do was to create a, a bit of strategy without cars having to come in and, and uh, have a pit stop. And so we created this, this um, uh, attack zone, which is a, a Chevron zone, which drivers go into and they get more power for a period of, 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 of two laps. And that that's again, gives them a performance advantage, but it's the strategy in terms of when do you use it? How do you use it? And it's all delivered through um, AR. So if you're at the race itself, um, yes, there's a there's a screen there, but it's nothing like your at home experience. So we're looking at what the next iteration is. We're looking at Extreme E. We want to have fan involvement. We've got a couple of ideas that we're chucking around at the moment. We've got a concept called. Um, well, I better not. I better not um, go into that here. But no, go uh, on, go on, Ali, go on. Tell no, us. no, no, no. We, 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 we've got a, we've got a great concept, which is, which is true to to extreme e, which is around jumping, um, and drivers that have the longest jump, and 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 we will, we will be um, giving advantages to 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 those drivers. So what what we're trying to do is to 
is to act like a game where you know you're you're giving benefits to those people that 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 are in the game and 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 that's that's i suppose the mindset is we we spend a lot of time on on platforms like twitch understanding the relationship between the esports athletes and their fans um not just kudos but donations and 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 how do we how do we create more of a uh, um a two way relationship between um the the fan and 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 ultimately the the athletes and the teams and i think that's where our sport is going because we clearly want to grow and develop a sport which is focused on the next generation and the next generation of of electric car buyers i think we nearly drew a secret out of you there ali but you just about pulled it back and uh, so well done for that um ben um on this topic of gamification, um, away from motorsport, perhaps, as you look across a variety of sports um, in terms of those that you, you work with and, and maybe will be working in in the future, what are the ways in which, uh, what are the other ways in which sport is set to be gamified, do you think, based on, given what you know about the technology that exists and is likely to come on stream in the next, uh, next period of time? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um... I think, I think Ali's, Ali's got some great stuff that he talked about with uh, with the, the power boost and such. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a massive Formula E fan um, as, as an electric car owner myself. Uh, I, I love the sounds. I think they're great. Um, uh, obviously, I, I aspire to, uh, to to head to uh, Formula E driving as well. Um, but uh, but I think you know being able to engage the fans is the biggest part of gamification. It's it's the biggest part of um, of, uh, of, of being able to just bring a new generation of sports fans in. I think what, one of the things that we're seeing at the moment is with the uh, with the amount of non-live sport, you know, there's a lot of federations and leagues and clubs that are going to eSport to be able to uh, to be able to engage to their fans and the younger fans. And I think there's been a, a, a really big success with that eSport. Uh, I think people are actually watching it because because they're enjoying it and they're enjoying. Um, sometimes a table being turned on on uh, on drivers and on, on footballers, um, so, and you know there's 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 a wealth of stuff out there that's that's going to happen and, and going to change now with the game occasion. I believe. When you're bringing in new technologies or you're bringing in new um, elements of gamification to the fabric of a sport or to how it is um, broadcast, distributed, and consumed. What, in both of your views, is the best way to marry up the implementation of those new technologies or new features with data and analytics about who's watching, why they're watching, how they're watching, whether it's making a positive impact? Ben, maybe if we come to you on this one first. Yeah, I think data and analytics are, sorry, data and analytics are words that are thrown about very, very a lot by uh, by companies, by vendors, and and, and by uh, broadcasters as well. But I think really what you need to do is, is is analytics is actually about understanding the content that you have and the content that you're making available. Mm. So not thinking about it from a personalization point of view, think about it from the content. So is your content performing in the way that you would like? Um, thinking about things like binge tracking, measuring that engagement, and also. Things like attention indexing, are people engaging further? Um, what do you really understand about that content that you're putting out there? And, and same question to you, Ali. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I, I think data is the new king. I, I, I think unless you've got data as part of your, your, your strategy, it, it, it is, it is the, the single biggest point for, for all sports and, and all brands now because um, I think in the past you 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 sort of waited for for Barb to to give you what your what your audience was and you, you know you would wait you know overnight and then you would get Barb and then you would you would sometimes be incredibly happy sometimes be disappointed and you wouldn't be able to tell really definitively why what point did they come in what were their demographics what you know really in in depth and I think what it allows you to do now and um, this is specifically with OTT is is the 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 ott providers can can find out when people came on when they left what are the things they watch uh when do they consume do they consume live do they consume um um you, you know delayed um do do, do is it 80 percent live 20 percent, or is it always the same people that do one or or, or t'other and i think what we're seeing with sports now is 
we're getting far more feedback and, and it's making, um, I suppose, the, the, the broadcasters so much smarter in terms of the, the, the products that they have that really work, really drive the platform, so really drive, drive Sky or, or really drive DAZN or really drive Eurosport. You know, the, the, the point now is, is there's a lot more information so that you're not having this cloak and dagger sort of conversation on, on how much rights are worth or how much they're, they're not worth. You're, you're actually having a proper discussion based on actual performance of, of products. And, and what you can do is you can see very, very clearly how your marketing is working very, very quickly. You can see what you're doing in social. You can see the relationship between social and, 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 and live sport. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's only going to grow in its importance. Um, I think it's still in its infancy. And, and when you overlay platforms like Amazon that also can tell what, what people have been shopping for, you start to build up an incredible understanding of your of your customers and, 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 and their value proposition to partners. We've just got time for a couple more uh, questions. Um, one, one thing that I'd be interested to hear from both of you is, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about different types of technology, different uh, types of um, uh, approaches that will, will get content to market. What's, what's the one piece of technology or the one solution that you're particularly excited about um, as you look across what's available or soon to come on stream? And maybe we'll kick off with Ali uh, to yeah. give us something, I'm sure, from uh, Formula E slash Extremey. Well, it, it's, it, it, do you know something? I, I'm, I'm going to uh, put myself out there. And I'm going to say drones. And uh, the reason I'm going to say drones is, is we've tried to use drones a number of times in Formula E. The regulations around drones when you've got live crowds is incredibly difficult. They have to be tethered. They have to get, you know, they're, they're, they're controlled like, like aircraft. And so it's incredibly difficult to use them in a live sports environment um, it, as well as they could be used. Now, with Extremely, I think I've, I've said that we're going to the middle of nowhere. Um, we, we have our drivers and cars and we're hiring the very very best drone racing pilots so that's people from the professional drone leagues and we're teaching them how to film and so the perspective and the broad you know uh, perspective that, that they'll have of the mountains of the ocean of you know the environments that we're in will be will be incredible and then the ability to overlay graphics and and, and ar and vr is is absolutely first class so that's we're probably going to be the first sport that really goes down that route of um, using drones to, to such an extent. So that's the wide shots and that's also the racing shots where you're getting incredibly close to the cars and you're getting that feeling of speed and that feeling of, of just a different view, which isn't an onboard camera. It's a, it's a view of what's coming up next. Is it front? Is it behind? And just gives us a lot more flexibility and excitement. Um, and, um, I think that's going to be one of the signatures of, of, of the championship. Ben? I, I, I'm still really excited about the, uh, the drone prospect, <laughs> which, uh, which Ali just talked about. But uh, I think moving on from that, you know, being able to have all these different facets of, of capturing content, being able to have all these driver cams, uh, drone footage, helicopter footage, chase cars, you know what that is? That's just like a huge amount of content. So what do, what do we enable customers to do with that content? How do we enable customers to show that content in a really good and, and, and worthwhile way? How do we allow them to, uh, to switch between those pieces of content and to actually draw, use them in a, in, a, in a way that drives people to their live product? So I think really user-generated content is probably, I think is gonna come back in a, in, in a big way. The devices that we have these days are so powerful. They, they work so well. And especially on these sports where there's not going to be very many people around, hopefully it won't be for too much longer, and we'll be able to get people back in stadium and back around tracks. And and you know what, being able to use that user-generated content within a program will be really exciting. So I think there's uh, there's there's lots of stuff that we are we can we can be very excited about going forward. You know, especially around the analytics that we gain from what people are watching and how we're making informed business decisions around the content that we're buying and selling. It's, uh, it's exciting times, definitely. 
Time for one final question to both of you. And we have been finishing, or we've been trying to finish, with a rallying cry from our guests across the last four days. So dust off your best rhetoric and get ready to supply a message to the industry. How optimistic are you both about sport's ability to come through this crisis and thrive once again? Ali, dust off that rhetoric. What have you got to say? Yeah, I, I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to come out of this with much, much better uh, innovation and, and broadcast products. And uh, when you integrate that with, with the live fan experience with, you know, football clubs and rugby clubs and, you know, international sport, Olympic Games, I think it's going to be incredible. And, and I, I'm really looking forward to the future. But I think, you know, coming back to COVID, I think, um, you know, there's so many good stories of how sports has conducted itself in, in COVID. And I think, you know, we should all be really, really proud, whether it's been Mercedes or QEV that have developed ventilators or whether it's been, you know, local, local support from clubs to their local communities. I think, I think you know, it's, it's, it's been great. And I think what we feel passionate about is focusing on, on the next challenge, which is climate change. And that is... Uh, has, has the ability to be a hundred times worse than COVID if, if, we, if we don't take it seriously. And I just think sport for purpose will, will, will grow because I think brands have to be really, really clear of how they go forward, what they want to get involved in because budgets will be tight. And I think sport for purpose and sport that demonstrates um, you know, how, how it's gonna be able to uh, enact with, with, with the future society, I think will be fantastic. And Ben, final word to you. I think I'll, I'll, I'll pull out some old cliches and, uh, and say, you know, challenge and adversity, you know, totally drive innovation. And I think one of the things we're seeing at the moment is that they're not just driving innovation, they're hyperinflating innovation as well. We're moving at such speed to, to bring technology to, uh, to the fore, to be able to run, you know, our, our broadcast lives as we see it, um, you know, remote production. You know, the uh, the evolution and jump that we've had from, from remote production right now to the stuff that we were dabbling in for a while to suddenly we have companies completely remotely producing television, um, live television programs. Um, I think, you know, all the hard work that technologists and planners are putting in right now to be able to deliver products to the consumer, um, it's just going to pay off in, in, in trolls later on down the line when we get back to some sort of normality. Really interesting conversation. Uh, thank you to you both for your time uh, today and for being with us. Uh, Ali Russell, Commercial Director at Extremi, and Ben, ben Davison, Director for Sales uh, for Europe at Comcast Technology Services. Thank you both. Thanks very much. Thank you. And that, James, brings us genuinely to the end of uh, Leaders Week Direct, or at least the content element of it, because uh, as you are keen to say, the platform remains open for business. The platform remains open for business for all types of networking and catching up, whatever you would like to do. It's going to be up there on the internet until midnight, BST, June the 8th. Um, there are informal, unofficial networking drinks going on in just a few ticks. A Zoom link has been posted on the activity stream for you to click on and enjoy a beverage. Uh, well, it's not really on us, but with us. Mm, that's right. Um, and I think, David, that is about the size of it from us. Indeed. Uh, thank you once again to all our partners. Thank you uh, to all our speakers and all our guests uh, through the week. Uh, thank you to the team who have been uh, putting all this together, both here, skeleton crew in in the studio and people uh, working from home, uh, the leaders team. Uh, and also thank you most of all to you for watching and dipping into our content through the week. Um, from For the last time, James, for the last time from mm. our London studio, it's bye-bye for now. Thank you.